This is exactly right. It's the brightest spotlight in the world. <laughs> we truly can't see anyone but the people with their teeth against the stage. The Are you guys, babies. sir, I'm going to talk to the people that work here. I think we can get like two more rows here <laughs> in the front, don't you? At least. These Layer are the it up a little bit. Who get kicked in the face Come if we on, get mad. Come on, punk rock. So, don't piss us off. We're a punk rock podcast. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Right? Oh my God, we're finally in Cleveland. This was, this was not the city Georgia was talking about. It was not. Why did I ever say (laughs) that there was a state, I think it was, that I didn't want to go to? We were young. We were young podcasters. We were real stupid. We We thought. We didn't think anyone was listening. (laughs) And we're just chitting, chatting away. We went to, we had been to, like, we had done, like, a 300-room place before. And we're like, why would anyone come? I'm not going to this place. And yeah. it's like, yes, you are. Yeah. Shut up. <laughs> Steven! <laughs> yes. Let's hear it. He's not here. He's not here. But. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> there he is. You see that up there? Look at Steven's cookie face. Explain it. Explain this to it's Steven. Well, it's it's perfectly Steven. Uh-huh. Uh huh. Georgia, it, we looked at it. I said it has his grabbing eyes. <laughs> Let him see. His Look at those. Steven's piercing. eyes are always like, "Do you need anything?" <laughs> and um, Georgia sent him a picture of it, and he responded, "I wish my lips were that full." <laughs> That's our Steve. That's our Stevie. Thank you, uh, Danielle at MK Sweets. She made yes. us an oh, incredible right there. box of like all those cookies. And one of them, I've never seen this before. It, it was like a pink, cute little like beauty shop thing. And it said fingers and faces. Fucking on it. fingers and faces. Love it. We love a good inside joke. She isn't some phony cookie making pseudo listener. She knows the <laughs> deep live show references. <laughs> Like fingers and faces. Yeah. Um, Speaking of the ones you just painted. Oh my God. I literally did this two minutes ago. And then I was like, we are standing outside of the door and I go, Georgia, can you fluff, fluff my hair up for me? <laughs> I, I can't get in there right now. What with my fingers and my faces. <laughs> can't do it. I thought you were really going to bust out with something right there. No, that felt good. Do you want to sing um, Little Mermaid again? No. Okay. I do want to tell you guys that I forgot my meds on this trip. (laughs) It's not my fault. Full transparency. Sharing always. One, have birth control. We have no boundaries. I really did though. Here's what happened. I, I, I'm like so good at packing and I put all my stuff in my little thing and then I hang up and then it's like everything is there. And then uh, the <laughs> electricity went out of my apartment before we like right as we were leaving the house. Ooh. We paid the bill. It's fine. That's Elvis unplugging something. <laughs> I guess you can't go. Oh, because oh, oh. he loves me. Because he loves you so much, much more than Steven. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, and as I was leaving, and then Vince is like, Vince is Mr. St- like, we have to leave right now for the airport. Sure. In a good way. Because <laughs> I'm like, we can get there 20 minutes before. So the thing fell. Everything fell out of it. I picked it all up in the dark. Didn't pick up my pill. <laughs> now, just birth or all pills? Oh, everyone. Every pill? Mm-hmm. Honey. No, 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 it's fine. So I call, like, fucking shout out to CVS, who are fucking on it. <laughs> I mean... Promo code murder. <laughs> a 
Oh, that's right. At live shows now, we're doing uh, ads too. <laughs> It's, um, there, these are high integration ads where we totally pretend like we're talking about something yeah. and this, none of this happened. Cause I can't live without my Wellbutrin. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get that fucking ching, pharmaceutical ching, ching. money. Ching. Oh my God. Dude. That's the, that's the shit right there. And we start naming, uh, Zeljans or whatever. And it's <laughs> just fucking, that's my beach house. That's my mountain that's house. Right. That's my beach and mountain house. I can live without Wellbutrin, but you can't fucking live without Effexor. What's Effexor? Effexor is for anxiety, and it d does this thing that everyone who's not taken it for a day knows. It gives you this thing that they call the zaps. Oh. So you just like, you, you just, your brain kind of like gets a, like a little, oh, catch up, catch up. It's fucking creepy. <laughs> okay. Um, this is going to be a separate, a separate topic. Okay. And this is... Uh, just because uh, if you have an effects or pill, I would love to just look at it for one second. I just want to see what color it is. <laughs> Not now, after we'll talk about it, but just, I don't know, palm me an effects or. You okay. want the zaps? No, you're asking for me. I'm jokingly asking for you it. without involving you. Get it, get it, get it, got it. Oh, well, so well, the cops don't arrest okay. us. Got it. Well, I, d I called CVS and I was like, hi, I did this thing. And in like in a half an hour, they gave me like two pills for today and tomorrow. Oh, they covered you? Yeah. Fucking CVS. Yes, but then I where was your like, family lives in a pharmacy. I What's was like, I can just ask. I could have asked the crowd for. Oh yeah. <laughs> but I don't want to take your pills. Someone rolls up like, one of those little black suit suitcases. I'm actually an Effexor <laughs> rep. <laughs> You're doing great business for our company. However, if in nine months from now I'm pregnant, this is the reason. <laughs> oh my God that child would immediately become a nun. You know how like, <laughs> your pa you always do the opposite thing that your parents want yeah. you to do. Wait, you're calling me a slut? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I guess I am. <laughs> Good on you, slut. <laughs> All right. I meant, I was trying to think opposite of murder. Oh, <laughs> I get it. Same diff, it's yeah. all sins. Or, yeah, an EMT. <laughs> Yes. Or a murderer. Right. I guess. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> this is a gorgeous it really rug. Is. I wish you could. You guys can see it, right? That's why you paid top dollar for those seats up there. We'll be selling replications at the merch table after the show. <laughs> Little mouse pads that are just this rug. <laughs> Oh, uh, it really is lovely. Oh, by the by, this is my favorite oh, yeah. murder. <laughs> hey. A true crime comedy rug podcast. That's Karen <laughs> Kilgara. And that's Georgia Hardstar. <laughs> and we're all here to talk about tragedy uh, within within a, uh, a gazebo of comedy. Let's say it that way. The tragedy is not funny, mm -mm. but what we have a great time in this gazebo <laughs> around it. Yeah, it doesn't have to be a sad gazebo or a happy gazebo. That we're just there. It's yeah. a, a, it's, we contain multitudes. Yeah, and so does the gazebo. And, and really, bottom line is, if you don't like it, get the fuck out. <laughs> People just start storming up the aisle. <laughs> Everyone who works here quits and just fucking leaves. <laughs> no, 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 no. We, we didn't need, need you. We need you. Uh, no. Let's see. It's real fucking cold here. Just so. <laughs> oh. I don't know. I'm sure you know, but. You guys know now, right? I feel when we left LA, it was 82. Oh, my God. They turned <laughs> on us. <laughs> Listen, we don't use aerosol. We're not responsible is, for the. We didn't create this particular hole in the ozone. No. Sorry. I feel like that the reason they're giving us a spotlight is to recreate how it is I in know. LA. It's a, it's a balmy 78 up here right it now. It really is. Um, we don't know how I, well, I don't know how to dress in cold. No. I don't understand. When, so, when someone's like, it's 20 whatever, I'm like, well, I don't know what that means. I'm going to yeah. wear this cute trench coat. I'm just going <laughs> to just keep on keeping on with this what I've it. got going. This is all I got. And we, it was, again, that thing where we step out of the body of the airplane and that little gap <gasps> between the airplane and the walkway. 
It's like, what the oh. fuck, Alaska? <laughs> it was snowball time. Oh I was like, this is super uncool. Yeah. Um, but but we're doing it. We did it. And, uh, and cute thanks. coats. Barred a, barred a coat to do it. <laughs> no, we love it. So, I mean, yeah. if there's any place to come and discuss tragic murders, Cleveland's got it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Going on. You guys. I think Ohio as a whole. Like, we could just do Ohio yeah. over and over. This state. Drive. It doesn't always happen because sometimes, you know, there's a lot of things that the qualifiers for a live show story that you need. You yeah. know, a, a couple things going on. Yeah. A couple elements in it, you know, not just a straightforward, horrible thing that happened. And uh, man, just Ohio keeps on giving it. Just like hand over fist. Uh-huh. How about this? Uh-huh. Do you like clowns? What about rivers catching on fire? <laughs> what about fu- fuck? That's right. What about clowns catching rivers on fire? Could you imagine? What about a balloon drop that kills people? <laughs> That's real. Fuck. Superman. He saves people. What about Superman? <laughs> but you guys made him up anyway. <laughs> In the airport, there's, as you know, in your beautiful airport, there's a Superman station uh-huh. where there, where Superman is. Uh-huh. Hold, he's, he's holding really still. Mm-hmm. And then there's a story of Superman being broadcast aloud to everybody waiting for their bag, mm-hmm. which is nice. They should do that in every city. Mm-hmm. Or like, but not with Superman. No, no, no. That stealing. would be a ripoff. Yeah. What would L.A. do? But there was a little, like, probably two-year-old boy that was so stoked that oh Superman was in the airport. But I thought he was saying souvenirs. <laughs> and I was like, that is the cutest thing in the world, <laughs> that he wants to buy souvenirs. <laughs> Meanwhile, Superman was five feet away from me, <laughs> just, just eight feet tall, and like a man's voice blasting, You're like, Superman was invented in my table. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, he said souvenirs. <laughs> It's a toddler that loves keepsakes. <laughs> keychains. He's got a collection of keychains. <laughs> He's got little license plates for his bicycle. Yeah. But he kept screaming Superman and his dad would take, get, take him away from it, put him down, and the kid would fucking rip back over to Superman. And he was yelling it in a way that like made me kind of sad because I can make anything sad. Uh, <laughs> that Especially was... when you don't have your Zell jams. Exactly. Or whatever it is. <laughs> Uh, where it was just like he was screaming Superman and like not understanding why the rest of us who are like sad and old and like <laughs> understand what life is like he was letting everyone know yes. and why isn't anyone like Superman you guys he's like just, why are you facing that fucking <laughs> luggage rotunda that just keeps spinning staring at it like moths to a flame yeah. Superman is right fucking there <laughs> Right. So tragic to be a child. Oh, God. Ugh. So stupid, right? <laughs> you just don't know anything. Fucking stupid. 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 Uh, should we? Do you, wait a second. What? Is this a new 70s dress no. from the last one? This is not the last 70s dress I had that has cat hair on it. It's the other 70s right. dress I it's have that new. has cat hair on it. Oh, shit. Look at that. What happened? I mean, it's just everywhere. I was excited about it. Oh, I mean the cat hair. Oh. Um, no, this is... I've had this before, but I, this is sticking to my rule of only wearing comfortable 70s and 80s dresses from now on. Walk it down. Walk it down the rug. Thank you. Look at her. Oh, yeah. Oh. And let's start up here. Cut my own bangs. Yeah, girl. Got to do it. When you're out of your pills and you got nothing to do. Yeah. Teeny tiny scissors. That's right. Um, Let's talk about your, you have a revelation. Uh, Or an exclamation. um, Yep. Couple. (laughs) When we, I bought a new dress uh, from, of course, the fashion retailer Target and <laughs> right I'm always like $29.99 hell yes yeah. then I'm surprised when you uh, it says you can wash it but you can't wash it you can't so I on the where were we last Whew. Uh, the uh, New Orleans New Orleans yeah uh, the first night I went out in that dress having had washed it then afterwards People are so kind to post pictures <laughs> of my middle-aged ass on stage and 
It looked like I had thrown on a child's romper and been like, watch this, this will be fucking hilarious. And then gone out on stage mortified. So of course I do my backup outfit, which is, I keep ending up in my backup outfits. (laughs) You can't call them that anymore. I I can't. This is the front up outfit. I just want (laughs) to, I, like many of you, just want to wear pajamas in public. So. Mm. Oh, we had a new idea of a come as you listen. Yes. The show thing. Right. Just come the way you listen. Do you, do you work out when you listen to the podcast? Do you, are you a, a doctor? Come in your scrubs. Poop. Are you a Clinique uh, helper? Bring us Clinique. <laughs> Wear your, bring us cli- Clinique in your white Clinique fake doctor's outfit. Yeah. You fake Clinique bitches. <laughs> what? <laughs> that's how I, that's how you find out I'm Lancome. Hardcore. La- hardcore Lancome till I die. Product placement, product placement, product placement. Just a dollar bills falling from the ceiling. <laughs> Also, but this is your farewell tour of this outfit. You yes, said. that's right. I'm going to burn this when I get home. <laughs> <laughs> I also just can't find the time Oy. to make myself look nice. <laughs> so I overcompensate with the hair and then I see what happens. <laughs> I dig it. It's fun. The hair is great. It's fun. I mean, you think like you're you're at a, a, a historic theater uh, for the huge show with a ton of people. And a lot of light. Wear your sweats. Wear your sweats. <laughs> Why even have this opportunity and power if you can't abuse it terribly? <laughs> well, if you show that you care, then they won't respect you. That's exactly right. <laughs> That's when they start using you. Well, like how they say, I, I, I've heard like on improv, it's like, don't dress cute because they, they'll be mad at you so they won't laugh at your shit. <laughs> Where it's like, well, I just want to dress cute all the time. Yeah, or be good at improv. Right. There's always that. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, that's, one girl on the team that we had to put on. You can't, <laughs> you can't dress like you like that's yourself true. Yeah, anymore. exactly. Fuck you, improv. Fuck you and your rules. Wait, what are we... We're, what's no, this about no. now? <laughs> There's an improv team in the center of this audience. Oh, it's like, they're finally saying what I've always <laughs> wanted to say. Uh, um, Here you sit down. Should we sit down? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. Hey. Oh. Thank you. I like a mid-height, kind of high-low chair. This will be interesting. Usually the seat's up here, and there's a lot of danger for me in getting into it. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> done and done. Does anyone have a phone book? Do they still make phone books? <laughs> or phone books still Do you, They make them only for you to throw them away. Oh, good. I just want to, yeah, we're, this is going to go to the hometown murder person. I'm sorry we're giving your cookies away, but it's, we can't eat all of them. <laughs> okay, get, let's get real. Let's get reality. Okay. With America's number one meal kit, HelloFresh, you'll get easy seasonal recipes and pre-measured ingredients delivered right to your door. All you have to do is cook and enjoy. HelloFresh makes cooking delicious meals at home a reality. From step-by-step recipes to pre-measured ingredients, you'll have everything you need to get a wow-worthy dinner on the table in about 30 minutes. Say goodbye to endless grocery store trips and takeout. HelloFresh has you covered. There's something for everyone, from family recipes to calorie smart and vegetarian, and fun menu series like Hall of Fame and and Craft Burgers. HelloFresh has more five-star recipes than any other meal kit, so you'll know you're getting something incredible. HelloFresh is flexible, and it fits your lifestyle, easily change your delivery days, food preferences and skip a week whenever you need. Break out of your dinnerette and make deliciousness part of every week with HelloFresh. I love that even though HelloFresh is super easy and they make it really basic and like straightforward, you still feel like you're cooking this like incredible home cooked dinner and that makes me feel good about myself. And that instead of just ordering takeout, I'm actually making something and preparing something at home and that just, it feels good. So for $80 off your first month of HelloFresh, go to HelloFresh.com slash Murder80 and enter Murder80. It's like receiving eight meals for free only at HelloFresh.com slash Murder80, promo code Murder80. Go by. Am I now, you first or are you first? It's me. Okay. Um, and I'm excited because we don't always have control yes. over our own images. But tonight, tonight, tonight we have control. 
We can go back and forth in our image. Um, the last, I believe it was Nashville, wasn't that the one where we were like, and so they got married, and there's a picture of them as a couple, and then mm -hmm. it was like two, three, four, mm -hmm. five, six. It made for seven, great comedy eight. just to be like, it's still up there, it's still up there. Yeah. The photo was still, but this time that's not happening. Unless we do it to ourselves. Yep. Which we absolutely will. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, guys, there's, again, we said it, so many people to choose from. So many, so many classics. But when I looked up this story, uh, I couldn't not do it. And I don't know if you know it. It's the unbelievable story of serial killer Ed Edwards. Oh, my God. Do you know that? Of course, dude. There he is now. Oh, no. Ed Edwards, Edward Edwards, not his real name, if you can believe that. Okay, so today, in looking this up, uh, Steve, Steven sends us all of our links. He does a lot of, like, ground... Steven! Steven. He does a lot of research for us, um, which is great. But then I stumbled... There's a show, and I, a lot of you probably have heard of it or watched it, but I never have because I'm almost 50. It's on YouTube, <laughs> and it's called Brain Scratch. Have uh -uh. you watched it? Uh-uh. Guys! Uh, okay. <laughs> It's so good. It's a guy. Okay, this is these are the guys. It's a guy named John Lorden, and he basically takes you through these cases. Like he started this one by reading the Wikipedia page, which I'm like, that's my thing. <laughs> um, but he basically is like pulls you through all the research, all that like amazing stuff. Where I'm like, oh, these are the people that hate our show. Oh <laughs> yeah. Where you're like, oh, they care about facts and dates. Um, <laughs> But it's, you have to watch it because it's not just this case. He's got uh, shows about all the, all the true crime stories that interest you, and they're really cool. So, and because of that show, uh, I had a nervous breakdown around 2 p.m. Oh, because this story changed quite violently um, <gasps> near the middle end. So let me just, we'll just walk you through it. So did you think, like, I got this story, everything's fine, it's straightforward, he's a serial killer, here we go. Yes. And then found out some secret shit about him? Yeah! I think I know one of the secret things and okay, I'm excited get about away. it. I'm excited. <laughs> oh, shit. No. Oh, no. Imagine. Our first fight. <laughs> it's blank. It's blank. <laughs> no, no, no. There's a nine on it. <laughs> Page I, nine. I did you a favor. Okay. Yeah. We didn't need that anyway. <laughs> Should we raffle this off? <laughs> yeah. Guys, come on. Also, there's, Ow. just so you know, there's not eight pages. Okay. Look at page eight. Is, it, that was a mistake. Okay. <laughs> Edward Edwards, who was born Charles Murray. What if his name, what if his born Charles Charles? <laughs> <laughs> or Murray Murray. Anyway, don't worry. Edward Edwards is not. Edward Edwards name. born Bill Murray. What? <laughs> what? I knew that guy was suspicious when he kept dropping in on everyone's wedding. Okay. Uh, he was born in Akron. That's right, Akron. On June 14th, 1933, he was illegitimate, and this is fucking horrible and really heavy. When he was around five, he witnessed his mother's suicide. Ooh. Horrifying. So uh, a couple years later, he goes, there's, they send him to an orphanage in Parma. Uh, I'm two for two with these city pronouncements. I can't. I'm so <laughs> stoked. They're loving it. It's gonna, fuck, we didn't ask anybody about that. It's... No. No. Yes. With a C? No, that's not right. Well, hold on. I just need the people up there to know. All of a sudden. Willow with. That's not the one we need to but, know. But just so you know, everyone in the front just started naming cities they think we can't pronounce. <laughs> <laughs> you raised your hand. Just right. whatever came to mind. Cuyahoga, what is it? Cuyahoga. Cuyahoga. But it's anyone, not spelled like that. Anyone. Wait, the Cuyahoga River. Oh, I know that one. That's not the same as the city you're talking no. about. I might have made up a word. No, Anyways. you didn't. That city's in mine too. Okay. We're going to pick one person. You're not helping. You said, <laughs> you just said Cuyahoga was the city we're trying That's to talk not about. It. That's fucking insanity. I bet you're not even from here. <laughs> Ooh. She's giving me the eye. No, she's crying. Oh. <laughs> oh, sorry. I don't have my glasses on. I thought you wanted to fight me. 
Sorry. <laughs> <clears throat> when the time comes, I'm going to ask you what the city name is. Okay. Stop crying so that you don't... Like, you're, let the swelling go down. It's later on. It's around page five. Okay. <laughs> okay, so he gets sent to this orphanage. Later on in life, he claims that the nuns there beat him, physically and emotionally abused him, which is very easy to believe. But then he blames his later life of criminal insanity on that. We call bullshit always on that. So, no, Ed. Um... So he, uh, he also claimed that when a nun asked him when he was little what he wanted to be when he grew up, uh, he said, quote, sister, I'm going to be a crook and I'm going to be a good one. Uh, so in 1948, when he was 15, he was sent to a reform, a reform school in Pennsylvania. And two years later... I think you pronounced that right. No. I don't think so. Two years later, he returned to Akron and he started committing burglaries. Um, then he, he basically got, he got to switch out. He was in juvenile detention. They said, if you join the Marines, you can leave here. And he was like, sounds great. Almost immediately goes AWOL. <laughs> <laughs> from Camp Lejeune in North Carolina. Wow, just people from everywhere in Cleveland. <laughs> How about Paris, France? <laughs> really? <laughs> no, I, <laughs> I've heard of Paris, France. <laughs> okay. You guys are fun. <laughs> so in April of 1952, um, oh shit, it's on page one. Okay. Show her. You guys are gonna say say that city. Chillicothe. Oh, Nothing like Cuyahoga. <laughs> Chillicothe. Chillicothe. You guys thought that that was the one we could pronounce? <laughs> Nobody fucking yelled that? <laughs> oh, you did. Okay. I'm sorry. She did. Stop talking sorry, to them. Sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> Even though I just had a full conversation with her. Okay. But she raised her hand. So that's <laughs> that's fine. true. Yes, we need a system in place. Yeah. Okay. So uh, the reason he went to chill coffee is if I've always known it uh, <laughs> for two years is because he was impersonating a Marine and um, he stole a car and went across state lines. So he ends up getting dishonorably discharged from the Marines, um, according to him, because later on, you'll see he wrote an autobiography. Oh, so great. <sighs> he yes, my least favorite thing. Um, <laughs> He described himself as being ruggedly handsome and equally cunning, which doesn't make sense. Was he either? Do so he's, a... he's saying he's ruggedly oh, cunning. Yeah. He's cunning like a mountain or man. Or is he equally handsome? He was equally handsome to a rugged cunning. thing. Cun cunning. He claimed to have spent his 20s hitchhiking, forging checks, and having sex all across the country. Me too! <laughs> Oh my God, in your 20s, when you, when you forge that first check oh. and you're like, I'm myself. Finally, I know yeah. who I am. Okay, let's ooh, take ooh, a look. Ooh, ooh. You may have seen this guy before. I wonder if I... Oh, I think that, we should go that way? Yeah. Oh. Right up those nostrils. <laughs> Was he in Sublime? <laughs> now that I look at it this yeah. way. Fake beauty mark. They used to always do that in the 60s. It's probably his zit. Started yeah. as a zit and they just yeah. painted it black with he mascara. He wishes he had full lips too. <laughs> He's starting a little Stephen mustache, but. Oh. Or maybe he just has large upper lip surface. <laughs> anyway, oh. remember that face. That it's going to come up later. Picture it right now wearing glasses. Okay, then we're going to stop talking about it. <laughs> okay. So. Uh, uh, uh. He claims that after being held on burglary charges in Akron in 1955, he broke out of prison by pushing past a guard. Huh. Oh, yeah. Just being rude. What? <laughs> Watch it. Well, excuse who's me. Yeah. That's how lots of prisons work. <laughs> <laughs> it was a honor based into his honor system prison it's like you promised you promised to stay here and not push yeah 
<clears throat> so then he fled across the country holding up gas stations for money as he went. And he said that during that time, he never wore a mask because he wanted to be famous. Uh, um, you're right. So after, he would have been a YouTuber today, I bet. What? He would have been a YouTuber today. <laughs> so after a series of armed robberies in 1956, six, whoops, <laughs> he was arrested in Montana and he was sentenced to the penitentiary in Deer Lodge. Okay, so... He's released from there. Thanks. Clear the cookie area. Thank you. <laughs> he was released from there in July of 1959, but then he was taken to Portland to stand trial for two armed robberies in 1956. So they like were like, oh, that's the guy from our thing. Bring him over there. He gets there. He's sentenced to five years probation, but while he's there... Um, uh, Oh, no, sorry, this is a different time. Wait, while well, he's there or another time. This guy literally did so many fucking crimes. <laughs> the idea that he just kept getting paroled and getting out really is a reflection of the time and the color of his fucking skin, I'll tell you that, <laughs> because it's so nuts. It's just like, oh, you, you held up another gas station? You know what? We're going to go ahead and give you a slap on the wrist. Get out of here, you nut. Um... <laughs> So he, he stood trial in Portland for two armed robberies in 56. Um, then he broke out of jail in 1960 in Portland where he, <laughs> this could, this could be a serious uh, Wikipedia mistake I made, but it says here where he'd been arrested for pulling a false fire alarm. It was a big deal back then. I mean... It wasn't it like a fucking prank that nerds did. No, that was like... You know why? Because back then you couldn't just reset a oh, fire alarm. Yeah. Once you pulled it, it was broken forever. Um, <laughs> that's not true. Okay. But while they had him there for the false fire alarm, he was questioned in connection with the double murder of a young couple from Portland mm -hmm. named Beverly Allen and Larry Payton. But no charges were filed. They could only question him. Or they only questioned him. Um, so then... So he's broken out of jail in Portland. They're looking for him. He's traced to Colorado, uh, where he... Oh. <laughs> it just... You don't seem like you mean it. So... <laughs> I don't know how well, to they feel. They left there. They're here now. So they're like, eh. <sighs> it was they're an like, okay childhood, but <laughs> I'm happy to be here now. I'm happy to be here. The air's a little thick for me. Um, okay. Okay. <laughs> Here's how they traced him to Colorado. He had, he had been cashing checks from the Portland Bowling Club, which he was a member of in oh, Portland. They had their own checks? Yeah. I guess he was the treasurer of the Portland Bowling Club, <laughs> or friends with the treasurer. And apparently they had tens of thousands of dollars what in the kitty. What are they doing? No, I'm just kidding. Uh oh. Um, <laughs> I was like, I got to join a, boiling, a bowling league. Yeah. A boiling league. I'm going to join a boiling league. Think how funny that would have been if I could have said it correctly. My God. Or if you would just start a boiling league where <laughs> you make hard-boiled eggs and spaghetti. Mm -hmm. I could join that. <laughs> Top ramen. <laughs> Easy. Okay. Just Can someone write down the boiling league for a TV pitch that we're going to do Stay for in. Food Network? <laughs> no, yeah, Stephen will get it. You don't have to worry about it. Um, okay. So, because of all this, and they can't find him, the bowling league and all that shit, in November of 1961, the FBI places him on the 10 most wanted list, uh, which is what he wanted. It's all about c crossing state lines when he was confined. After a robbery conviction, he's, they got him on all this stuff. So, he's captured two months later in Atlanta with his wife. Now he has a wife all of a sudden. <laughs> How did he find time to date with all the robberies and pushing of prison guards that he'd been doing? Still, there was time for love, and Ed Edwards made it. You think he met her on the bowling league? <laughs> oh! He was like, that throw is hot. Mm -hmm. I'm going to buy her some, a corn dog mm -hmm. and see where this thing goes. Y you've, uh, yeah. You know I do love bowling, though. You know I love corn dogs. Oh. Hello. I love bowling too. Why don't we? Why are we? Why are we podcasting right now? We can be bowling. <laughs> There's got to be a bowling uh, league we can join around here. Okay. Oh my god! <laughs> Everybody's got something to yell about tonight. I love that. There's a bowling oh league. Oh my god! Here. Our whole bowling league came tonight. 
the true crime loving bowling league in Cleveland. <laughs> Hell yes. Okay. So they send him when they ca- finally capture him when he's on the ten most wanted list. They send him to Leavenworth for sixteen years. Oh. Um, He's paroled five years later, of course. They just don't want him to stay. (laughs) Um, So this is where Ed the con man takes over. So he gets out of Leavenworth, and he claims that a benevolent guard that he met in Leavenworth, I didn't, that's a cut and paste word, I would never use it, but (laughs) a kindly guard had helped him um, reform while he was in jail, Mm. and now he wrote a book on his life of being a lifelong criminal called The Metamorphosis of a Criminal, colon, The True Life Story of Ed Edwards, fake name. Um, (laughs) (laughs) True life story of a fake name. Yeah. Um, so that he releases that in 1972 and he based, and he starts, he goes on a circuit and becomes an inspirational uh, speaker. Yes. Hold the phone. What? Oh, that's the fam. Oh, he has children. Yeah. Oh yeah. He ends that up. Him? The, that's him up there. It's yeah. He's gained like some it. weight. Yeah. Let's not be critical. <laughs> that's it happens when you settle down. Look, she has my bangs, a little girl. <laughs> you think she cut those herself too? She cut those herself after a couple white wines. <laughs> you know me. You know it. They, uh, they end up having five kids. Holy All crap. together. Yeah. And this is him as a family man. All right. Oh, and then we're going to... And then we're just going to show you this what? is... This was... Uh, it's a recording of his inspirational speech called... Uh, it says there, Ed Edwards says, build a fire in the person, not under them. Build a fire... <laughs> In the person, not under them. I feel like that was the first draft, and he should have kept going yeah. with that. A lot of times when you're trying to pick a title, it's good to, like, spitball three, four, right. ten ideas. Yeah. Also, that smile is so creepy. Anyone who looks that happy is a fucking monster. Yes. It looks like he, like, he takes the bottom half of his face off at night. <laughs> That's a weird thought, yeah. Karen. That's a weird thought. It's like all he knows about smiling is you just have to scrunch your entire face into the middle. <laughs> yes. Move, you know? move this part down. Move Keep this. these very still. Yeah. Eh. Eh. <laughs> we did it. We did. We really have. So everybody gets real inspired by his inspirational, motivational speaking, and he ends up going on two television shows in 1972 um, the To Tell the Truth program which I'm sure you loved back then mm-hmm. and a show called What's My Line he was <laughs> this is To Tell the Truth where so a panel would have to figure out if you were lying about your life story I'm a serial killer yep a hey, liar oh my god okay I I'm sorry, but I feel like the to tell the truth uh, font needs to come back. And then uh, also those, whatever those robot things I are know. back there. They're like penis robots. Just, <laughs> what are they? Penis robots. <laughs> I, I didn't want to say it the first time. She but... said penis robots <laughs> out loud to my face. <laughs> I just, like shows, things looked like this when I was very small. <laughs> So when I see it again, it just like... Makes you happy? It does a little bit, but then it also is like, oh, also I'm alone. Right. Like someone put me in a room alone. It takes you back to a time when you loved souvenirs. (laughs) Right? God, I remember when I loved souvenirs. All right, so he's basically a kind of a pseudo-celebrity... Everybody loves the idea that a man who was a lifelong criminal went into prison and a benevolent prison guard helped him see, you know, his way to um, mm. living the, a life of lighting fires inside of people. <laughs> people are I very mean, inspired by that. Is that really where how the story ended? It'd be a beautiful fucking story, <laughs> you know? And then he lit several people on fire. No, no. <laughs> Oh, not that. I just mean, like, legitimately, if you were reformed. Oh, yeah. It would be a great story. The fire well, part would be fun, too. It's, it's the idea that I feel like a lot of times when we talk about things like this, when you're like, how did this person get away with this for so long? Yeah. It's because other people want it right. to be true. So then when it starts to flake away of this is in no way true, you're like, no, but it is yeah. true. He was, he was, he lit a fire inside me. <laughs> so... The fame dries up, of course, as it always does, and I hope you remember that. (laughs) 
this is all, we're all on a clock here. Um, so he goes back to the skill that he learned in prison, which is carpentry, and becomes a handyman. He buys a house, in 1974, he buys a house in Doylestown, and Ohio. And Nobody? Everyone hates it. No one fucking cheer, or I'm saying it wrong. <laughs> Doylestown sucks? Doylestown! There's no W in this. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it feels good not to be the one. Just to, like, for, for fucking once. Oh, my God. Where's the W? I mean... It's silent because it's not there. <laughs> it's silent. It's a silent, invisible W. <laughs> Thank you. Finally, someone being helpful. Okay. In Doyle's town, ugh. <laughs> um, he builds a house uh, for his, or he remodels a house for himself and his wife and five kids. And, and then around town, he becomes this family man. And of course, he does the thing that all great psychopaths do. He begins to try to ingratiate himself with the police. Mm. So um, he hangs out, although he's a big talker, not a, not a big drinker, but he hangs out in bars, listens, gets people to talk to him, mm. and then basically becomes a snitch. Um, so he starts telling the police about local crimes that he's heard about. Mm. And, uh, and he hangs out with the police. They hang, they hang out at, at their house. Mm. Um, uh, basically, um, he, they, they come home one night um, and their house is burning down. Mm. Uh, and the uh, police and the fire department find evidence of arson. And so Edward tells his family that some a criminal he informed on um, found out that he was the snitch, and so that now we have to go on the run. And so uh, he starts moving his family to a new state like every six months or so. Um, because it turns out that Ed Edwards is going to shock you. He was not reformed in Leavenworth. <laughs> oh. Yeah. His record was bullshit, <laughs> even though the cover was beautiful. Um, so real quick, we're going to skip ahead to 1980, um, to this cold case. So in the August of 1980 in Jefferson County, Wisconsin, a young couple, oh, sorry, my cab's here. I have to go. <laughs> Why? <laughs> That's the Jefferson County bird caller. I mean, he's here tonight or she. Women can whistle too, Karen. Okay. So August of 1980, a young couple named um, Tim Hack and Kelly Drew, they go to a wedding reception at a place called the Concord House, which is this big place where they held, there was like two wedding receptions being held there that night. Um, they're both 19 years old. They were high school sweethearts. Um, they left the party together, the, the reception together, and they were never seen again. The next day, um, Tim's dad goes to the Concord House, finds Tim's car still in the parking lot. Um, then, uh, five days later, they start finding pieces of Kelly Drew's clothing, um, like uh, out in the country. Mm -mm. Well, the whole thing's out in the country, but around. Um, so then the police have to go in and in interview everybody that was at the Concord house that night, all the guests from both weddings. Um, and they have, they end up with no leads. Um, there's no clues. Um, and the case goes cold. Two months later, uh, their bodies were found. Tim Hack had been stabbed to death. Kelly Drew had been strangled. Um, and that's when this case became known in Wisconsin as the Sweetheart Murders. Mm. Um, and it was cold for decades. So uh, almost 29 years later, uh, this is in 2009, um, the state of Wisconsin gets a cold case grant and they get to reopen five cold cases and the sweetheart murders are one of them. So what they do is they go in and they get Kelly's clothing and they find DNA on it and they send it to the lab to get tested um, to see if they can match it. Um, and they, they do find uh, DNA from semen on her pants and so um, once they know that they might be able to match it, they, the police make this announcement um, to the public if anybody has any information about um, these two um, young people's murders, uh, anybody, if 
that was at the Concord House that night, any, anything, we want to hear from you. Well, at the same time, a 48-year-old mother of two named April Bellaccio uh, had been reading, um, reading up on cold cases. She read this article, and when she sees the picture of the Concord House, she stops cold. Um, because she remembers when her family lived in Jefferson County, and she remembered that her father had been the handyman at the Concord House, and she remembered that two days after the... That's right, I'm building up to it slowly. Two days after the couple disappeared, her father woke the family up in the middle of the night, put them all in a car, and moved to Pennsylvania. Her father was Ed Edwards. That's right. She had my bangs. She had her bangs. That's right. I think that was the mom. That was the mom. This is the daughter. So yeah, that's yeah. one of those babies. Yeah, the daughter had my bang. Oh, they didn't? Yeah. I thought you meant the mom. No, 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 the daughter. Oh, okay. Forget it. I was looking that, at that mom's calic going like, oh, it'd take me forever to blow the dry that out <laughs> and make that work. Oh, my God. Okay, anyway. This is very exciting. Uh, so here's how, here's went down. And she basically is, this is like, I feel like it's kind of what we're all in it for, where you read an article yes. and suddenly you get cold chills and you're like, I know that face. I'm the witness that you need or whatever. Well, did you see some girl did it today about The Bachelor? What? Did you see, read The Bachelor? Some fucking girl. <laughs> There's like a missing photo in a fucking humble humble times of like look at all these missing people and some girl like some fucking girl is in a true crime clearly looking at it she's like that girl's a contestant on the bachelor right now <laughs> and she's on the bachelor is for it's really her uh-huh. holy shit yes yeah. she told her mom she was going to work at a marijuana farm <laughs> instead of telling her she was going to be on the bachelor because her mom would be too ashamed yeah yeah but I'm thinking that maybe the bachelor is a front for a marijuana farm Ooh. they all work that would explain a lot of stuff on that show. It would. What if the the rose that, that yes. the guy gives is just paint red red painted pot? Or yeah. <laughs> it's how they traffic the stuff out of there. <laughs> Will you take this across state lines <laughs> and be my bride? That's right. Uh okay. Off topic. Anyhow, Excuse we're me. back. So uh a couple years after they moved to Pennsylvania. Um, in 1982, she then remembers that one night her mom was, had been in the hospital for an injury. Her dad took all the kids camping and um, spent the night. When they went home the next day, their house had been burned down. Because <gasps> also, who the fuck wants... To, uh, hey, kids, your mom's in the hospital really sick. Let's go camping. The woods. What? Um, this had been the third time that their house had been burned down. Mm-mm. Now... It supported this theory that, or this storyline that he was giving his family of bad guys are after mm-hmm. us and they're trying to get me because I was a snitch. Well, uh, to April's surprise, her three brothers went to the police and said, we're the ones that burned the house <gasps> down because our dad made us do it. What? So in 1982, um, Ed Edwards was arrested for arson and he was sentenced to two years in prison in P- Pennsylvania. I guess when you burn your own house down, they don't care that much. Yeah, it's your fucking house. Yeah. Don't light stuff on fire, but whatever, you did it. Um, he got out in 1987, and then now he decides he's going to be the family man. He's going to rededicate himself to this family. So he comes um, back, and uh, one of the sons is, uh, went off to college, but he still has the four kids at home. Plus, um, a boy named Danny Glockner, who had, uh, is one of his son's friends. They all went to high school. Danny came from a, a really troubled family um, anyway. here in Cleveland. More troubled than your dad? Is yeah, you know. Fucking arsonist? <laughs> he thought he was going to the perfect family. Um, so he starts hanging out. He becomes like a member of the family. And he stays with them for years, actually. Uh, Ed tried to adopt him. And the judge was like, no, he's 19. <laughs> <laughs> but... The judge did allow Danny to change his name from Danny Glockner to Danny Boy Edwards. Um, hmm. Yeah. So, hmm. yeah, I don't like it either. <laughs> um, so then Danny joined, um, after high school, um, Ed encouraged Danny to join the military. Um, and so he hurt his ankle um, how did this fucking story go? He hurt his ankle and he was going to get discharged. And so um, he t- he was telling Ed about that problem. And Ed was like, 
he, he basically was like, that's, it's, it's such a disgrace if you get discharged from the army, whatever. So <laughs> that guy was dishonorably discharged. <laughs> so he would know. Um, so Danny ends up going AWOL two days before he was supposed to be medically discharged um, from the army. And he remains missing for a year. And apparently Ed Edwards was obsessed with the fact that he was missing. And he told the police he was going to do everything he could to try to find Danny. Um, a year later, hunters find a shallow grave in the woods behind the cemetery in the city. It's Danny Boy Edwards, and he'd been shot to death uh, in the back of the head. Oh, my God. So Ed Edwards is distraught. He is g- going crazy about it. At Danny's funeral, he is asking people, what do you think happened to Danny? Ugh. Uh-huh. Very appropriate. Um <laughs> So that case ends up going cold. The police can't find any leads about that. So years pass, and all five of the Edwards kids are sitting... They're all grown up now. April has her own last name. They're all talking about um, Danny's murder and what they think could have happened. And one of... um, the older kids brings up the fact, you know, mom, in 1982, mom was in the hospital, but she, you remember why she was in the hospital? Dad stabbed her. What? Yes. So they didn't, not all the kids knew this, so they all start, like, sharing this information, apparently. Oh, man, when kids, when fucking siblings get high together, shit comes out. Yeah, that's right. Right? It's like, it takes, like, one Thanksgiving party uh-huh. where everyone has a little too much Baileys, and it's like, well, guess what? <laughs> Uh huh. That didn't happen that way. Yeah. You don't remember it, right? Oh, you think Aunt Carol's so great? <laughs> Listen to this. Well, this is even more horrifying. Apparently, Ed Edwards came home one day, and he want there was a bag of potato chips he wanted to eat, and he found it half eaten because there's fucking ninety seven kids in their family, <laughs> and that's all that happens when you have more yeah. than two children in the family. It's an eating contest. <laughs> He finds out that the bag's been half eaten and he stabs his wife <gasps> over it. But, but there's I, still half left. <laughs> I mean, also, don't stab your wife, but like. No, you're right. There's tons of problems. Tons of problems. I just picked one. With that reaction. Yeah. He really went, he really went straight to 60. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He didn't even, there was no discussion. Uh-uh. There's no who did this, sit yeah. down, respecting people's potato chips. <laughs> okay but so it's the older kids going this is what this is this and this is that and then we came home and then, then our house was burned down for the one millionth time um, <laughs> so April starts to realize her father is not the person she remembers him to be and she was only 11 years old when the sweetheart murders happened in Wisconsin but um, she did remember that her father was the handyman at the Concord house and she also remembers that he came home that night the night that the that they disappeared with a cut on his nose and a black eye and he told his wife he'd been in a fight Mm -hmm. but then later when the police came to question him because he was the handyman he told the police that it was from a hunting accident so he changed his story and April remembered that she said as she saw that picture and like as the city name and the place where he worked it was all coming together and she started having like these weird recovered memories of the information yeah so um he tells the cops hunting accident and then uh two days later they move away in the middle of the night um which is the it is a good time to move because there's not (laughs) the traffic is better it's not hot out yeah you're not like boxes back and forth to the car sweating right sunburns Lots of problems. I'm not sure what's next here. <laughs> oh. La him? I wanted you to see that jacket that he wore on To Tell the Truth. <laughs> I don't know if his wife sewed it for him off the couch or what the fuck happened. <laughs> but God, he looks like, you know, an, an, an evangelical preacher or something he like does, that. He does, actually. Doesn't he? He does. Like an all-American person. He, he looks like a different, another kind of person that could light a fire inside you. Right. Not under With you. With the Lord. Oh shit! From paradise. Don't look. look. What's okay. that? What is that? Oh, this is where it gets good. Oh my god! That's okay, not where I thought it was. Going. I know, I know, and I have to hurry up because it's taking too long. But <laughs> essentially, um, so uh, April calls Jefferson County Sheriff's Department. She talks to Detective Chad Garcia, and she's basically like, "My dad fucking killed. It was responsible yeah. for the sweetheart murders." Um, so. This detective, who I'm in love with, of course, he, he 
goes and looks at the case. He rereads the interview. He sees where um, uh, Ed Edwards said that his injuries were from a hunting accident, which is insane. Mm -hmm. Like, clearly fight injuries. And he's like, oh, I hit myself in the face with the gun twice. Um, <laughs> Then he reads Ed Edwards' book, The Metamorphosis of a Criminal, and uh, sees that this guy is basically fucking nuts out of his mind. Mm. So three weeks later, uh, he calls April, lets her know that the DNA that they took um, from Kelly Drew's pant, that sample, um, that they sent it into the lab, and they also got DNA from Ed Edwards, and it was a match. Yes. So they extradite him back to Wisconsin to charge him with a double murder. So at this point... Uh, old Ed Edwards is 77. He's got like permanent oxygen tank. He's got diabetes. He's very overweight, um, in very poor health. He knows they have him for the sweetheart murders. Um, but when he's in custody, he finds out that Wisconsin does not have the death penalty. So he writes a letter to the Ohio authorities and says, you're going to want to come talk to me because I got some shit to say to you. And so the what? cops from Ohio come up and then he starts confessing to the 1977 uh, unsolved murder case of 18-year-old Judith Stroud and 21-year-old Bill Lavaco, who had both been shot in the neck uh, while they were in a car. It was another lover's lane situation. Um, their bodies had been left in a public park. Then he confesses to the 1996 murder of his own foster son, Danny <gasps> Boy. That's right. He had Ed, so what really had happened was Ed had convinced Danny to go AWOL from the army, said, come out into the woods, I'm going to show you how you get out of, how you get out of military duty. Mm -hmm. And Danny's thinking he's going to show him some like, shoot yourself in the pan or whatever it is. And that's when Ed Edwards shot him point blank. <gasps> um, and it turns out that Edwards was planning to cash in Danny's $250,000 life insurance policy, Ooh. which he never got to do. Um, so in the end, after all of that, Ed Edwards pled guilty to five murders. He asked for the death penalty. They said, nobody. Um, <laughs> instead, he got four life sentences. Um, but don't get too excited because he was only in jail a month and then he died of ah, natural causes. Asshole. Oh, stupid bastard. Okay, now... Detective Chad Garcia of the Jefferson County Sheriff's Office says he is, quote, pretty confident that there are at least five to seven more murders Ed Edwards committed, and he gave a list of 15 confirmed and suspected mm. victims. So they have all these murders that, that hook into the timeline of Ed Edwards, which brings me to the mental breakdown part of the story, because <laughs> as I'm watching Brain Scratch... Oh, this is your mental breakdown. I thought you meant his. Oh, no. Okay. No. He's gone now. So... <laughs> Remember in the show, I think you did Nathan Barjona on mm -hmm, this show. Mm -hmm. So we've often recommended the TV show Real Detectives where real detectives tell you the story of cases that they had to work on and ended up closing. And so on that show, uh, on the episode about Nathan Barjona, the most hideous child killer of all time. The, I mean, that's a fucking contest to win, right? It, yeah, I mean, you really, there's a lot of competition. But... <laughs> That one bummed me out incredibly badly. Um, <laughs> nothing else bothers me on this show. <laughs> it's all so fun. Um, but on that show, did, uh, former police detective John Cameron is the detective that's explaining that story, and he's the one that closed that case. Okay. So uh, John Cameron has written a book called It's Me, Ed, uh, Edward Wayne Edwards, the serial killer you've never heard of. And in the book, he details the murders... Um, that Edwards has been convicted of, then he provides analysis and argument for a bunch of other murders that he thinks that Edwards is could be responsible for, including the murder of Adam Walsh in, 19, no. in 1981, the murder of Jean Benet Ramsey no. in 1996. But he was in Boulder. What? He was in Boulder. He was in Boulder, <gasps> and he looked like Santa Claus. Shit. He looked like Santa Claus. I, I'm okay. I buy it. Okay. Thank you. You just have to say it twice, and then, and then you're convinced. <laughs> say it really angry. He looks like Santa Claus. Okay. And then the Robin Hood Hills murders of Stevie Branch, Christopher <gasps> Byers, and Michael Moore. Now, this is, of course, all of this is like, it's, it's theory, it's conjecture. But 
so you know how, and April says this in, um, in her, there's an interview of hers where she talks about remembering how her father, as we said, ingratiated himself with the police. He was obsessed with police procedure mm -hmm. of, um, going in and basically watching the crimes that he committed that other people were getting, um, sent to jail for. He liked to go in and kind of stand around and be like, interesting. So in the documentary that we've all seen of, uh, the West Memphis Three, um, there's this very famous scene where these parents are at their son's, um, grave. I believe this is Christopher Byers' parents. It, it's the saddest thing in the world at this, at the grave. And then in the background. No, no, no. Yeah. No! Is that him? That's, they say it's him. Now, a lot of dudes look like that. So <laughs> it's like, it does look like Santa on vacation for sure. Does he have money in his hand? I don't know. Oh. What the fuck? If you watch, you can see it in the clip, and it's just the documentary just cuts away like there's other people at the cemetery. That will they believe that this is him Holy at the cemetery? Holy shit! Well, guess what else? In making a murderer, that's him in the hallway behind the lawyers. Are they and, sure it's him? They know it's him. Yeah, that is him because you'll see. There's oh shit! I don't. I think I have pictures of him later. But basically, yeah, you can... Yeah, I've seen him. Yeah, he's like yeah. this big dude. He has a real pointy, kind of downward-facing nose. And anyway, the, John Cameron theorizes that he set up Stephen Avery because he... Hold on! <laughs> <laughs> he lived an hour away at the time of Teresa Hallback's murder. And she disappeared on Halloween night, and he killed people on Halloween night. That's a bunch of, they, they traced, uh, I feel like now people are yelling at me. I know. I don't like it at all. It's not my fucking theory. <laughs> it stressed me out more than you don't like it. <laughs> Imagine me at three o'clock thinking I was done with my homework, and then this shit pops up. And it's the most interesting theory I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> You got them back. They're back. They're back and they They're love it. You. They love it. Okay. 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 He's basically the Zelig of modern murder, this man. <laughs> but there's one more. Oh, yes, that's right. John Cameron says that Ed Edwards is the Zodiac killer. Uh, yeah. Uh, 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 uh. Sorry, Ted Cruz. <laughs> <laughs> that's what... I only got to this part of the story. I got it to this part at like, what, six o'clock? And I was, that was past the uh, pictures point. You okay. can't, I can't get Stephen pictures past oh, right. like 5.30 or whatever. Right. So this is where you would see a side-by-side -side of early Ed <gasps> Edwards and that drawing of, this, of the Zodiac where he has glasses oh on. Oh my God, I'm seeing it in my brain and I can totally see it. Because he has a fucking plain white guy face and a pointy nose and if he just had some glasses yeah, on and a, like kind of thin lipped mm. right <gasps> is it him do you think he did yeah it? it's him it's definitely him well here here's the here's the thing uh he lived in northern california in the 60s um he, at the same time as each of the Zodiac's murders, um, and some claim that he closely matches that uh, original description. Others say, fuck no. Um, <laughs> but April, uh, Ed Edwards' daughter, says that he used to make the kids watch videos about the Zodiac what? killer. And while they watched it, he would scream, that's not how it happened. What? <laughs> I want her hometown murder fucking told. Dude, she just gets up and walks on stage. Oh. Give me that. Uh, done. So essentially, <laughs> to learn more about this case, <laughs> there's so much, I mean, like, I, I was going totally insane. So basically, if you want to see April uh, talk about how her father is a serial killer. It, two weeks ago on Investigation Discovery, there was a show called People Magazine Investigates. And, right, we all love People Magazine. It's the true crime Bible. Um, <laughs> murderers are just like us. My f the show is called My Father the Serial Killer. Oh my God. And it, it's April telling this whole story. It's super awesome. But also on Spike TV, uh, they produce a six part documentary called 
documentary series based on uh, John Cameron's theories called It Was Him <laughs> with Ed Edwards' grandson, a guy named Wayne Wolf, and they both go in and explore all John Cameron's theories about where he was and how he possibly could be involved in pretty much every famous murder of modern time. <laughs> um, yeah, basically, that's the story of Ed Edwards. There's, there's lots more. Sorry, that took so long. There might be one more picture on there, but I don't know what yeah, it is. Yeah, I don't want to show okay. mine. Roller fucking coaster ride that was. That was that, that was insanity. Oh, it, my God. Go on to brainscratchers.com because it has, like, all the uh, research. It has all this stuff, like, raw research that this guy has collected, and it's so crazy. That was bananas. Yeah. Now that I am pilled up and ready to go? Yeah. Okay. Are you guys ready? <laughs> For a fucked up story. I had never fucking heard of this. Oh. It's bananas. The Kirtland cult killings. Oh, shit. Holy shit. Do you know these? I do not. All right. And God damn it, I love a cult. I know you do. Yeah. I know you do. This is the worst mass murder in the history of Lake County. Fuck. <laughs> mass murderers here? Yeah, really quick. I feel like we should have explained this before. To the people who oh, are yeah. brought here tonight against their will. Mm -hmm. I don't know about the podcast. All the people who work here. Are partners of people who are like, I don't want you, but you did the thing with me, so I'll go to mm -hmm. this with you. I didn't, yeah. When you hear this cheering, it is not cheering for death. Nobody's no. cheering for that. It's more of like, we've all been sitting alone with this information for so long, and now we get to do it together. Yeah. All right. If that helps. So, Kirtland cult killings. Okay, so let's talk about the cult leader first. Okay. Fucking this dick, Jeffrey Lundgren. <laughs> he was born in, in May of 1950 in Independence, Missouri. Um, he's the child of super... No one cheers. Nope. Okay. <laughs> No Mormons here. Okay. <laughs> He's the child of strict, super religious parents. They're members of the reorganized Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. It's a small offshoot of Mormonism. Okay. Um, unlike most religions, they're open to the idea of modern-day prophets. Right? So you okay. Got, yeah. So... <laughs> According to sources, he, Jeffrey was severely abused as a child, and he was a loner throughout high school, but as he grew into adulthood, he became a religious fanatic. He was excellent at memorizing verses in the Bible and uh, the Church of Mormon book. Yep. <laughs> The Book of Mormon. <laughs> you know. But from the church. She wanted right. you to know. Uh, which he studied endlessly, so he's obsessed with religion. He goes to Central, Central Missouri State University, and he spends his... <laughs> oh. But you don't like the city? Okay. <laughs> He, uh, he hangs out at a house for RLDS youth, and he meets another student there named Alice Keeler. She had been told by a church elder that she was destined to marry a great church leader. Oh. So when she finds Jeffrey Lundgren, who's like, hey, what's up? I'm a modern-day prophet. Here's, here, listen to me spout all this fucking Bible shit I memorized. You know, college stuff. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. I know the book from Mormon. What's up? <laughs> She's like, oh, shit. Oh, this is him. Fuck. It's him. This is him. It, it's him. So, um, but they start fooling around out of wedlock, which mm -hmm. they're not supposed to do. And, no, unacceptable. Uh, right. And so Alice gets pregnant and then uh, Jeffrey flunks out of college. Whatever. They get married. <laughs> oh, I forgot that that's the college that we cheer for is the oh. people who flunked out of it. Oh, yeah. Yay. Yay. Flunk outs. Yay. It can work, too. Uh they they get married and by 1980 they have four children. So they're all still super religious. And by this time he starts telling Jeffrey starts telling his wife that he had visions that he was at the crucifixion and that he was with Christ when he died and he can see and he can also see the future. Just really quick, just to point out, yeah. people never have visions where like I was at the crucifixion but I was way in the back and there's like a <laughs> there's a tall guy in front of me yeah. that c c talked really loud the whole time. I didn't get it. Or is that the crucifixion, but it was for one of the other guys? It was the, that, those other criminals. It wasn't for the one guy. It was the, it was the upside down guys. It was not, there was nothing to write home about. <laughs> that never happens. Everybody's Cleopatra. <laughs> um, and Alice was like, 
Great. She believes him. Um, <laughs> she better. She has four of his kids. Yeah. Okay. He then told her that God had told him that, that they needed to move to Kirtland, Ohio. <laughs> it must be nice. If God's like, hey, then it must be a nice place. God's like, there's this amazing four-bedroom house. <laughs> really good square footage. There's a great room. So uh, that's where the first Church of the Mormon faith was, and it's a mecca for Mormons. So they're like, move there and like get more religious. <laughs> if you can. Like, try it. <laughs> Give it a whirl. So in April 1984, the Lundgren family moves from Missouri to Kirtland, and Jeffrey volunteers as a tour guide for the historic Kirtland Temple, and he also worked as a Bible study teacher. But uh, the church, like what, like the main dude, what do they call him? Priest? I don't know. Not in the, in the LDS, I don't think okay, they do. Okay, well, this main dude, not God. He's... <laughs> the one below God? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's walking... He's the wa- elder, the elder. elder. I knew it first. One of the chooch el- <laughs> One of the church elders is like walking by his Bible study thing and he, and he hears Jeffrey be like, forget everything that they just said at the at church today. <laughs> Listen to me. Every, and he's like spouting all this negative shit about like hell and stuff, which I guess they're not stoked on. Well, yeah. You know? To children? No, to like uh, el- older people. Oh, okay. Good. Um, and so the elders are like, bro, you can't do that. And um, so they also suspected him of stealing twenty-five to forty thousand dollars from Temple uh, the Temple uh, store, and so the Temple Bowling League. <laughs> <laughs> so they kick his ass out of the church. <laughs> you said the Temple store. Yeah, they had like a souvenir store. A souvenir, yeah, souvenir. Because yeah, yeah. it's like this. You know what I mean? Got it. Souvenirs like the Book of Mormon or a Big Superman. Right. A fo- what about a foam finger? It's just like, yay, God. Pointing up? Yeah. Yes. Okay, so this, by this time around 1987, though, he had already won over a small uh, uh, flock of his study group, about a dozen people. <laughs> flock. And uh, he, by claiming that he was a prophet, following God's orders, and promising that they would see the face of God if they followed his teachings. So they believed him, so they left the church with him. And uh, he began to prophesy that Kirk, Kirtland would be the site of the second coming of Christ. Wow. <laughs> Kirtland, Ohio. Mm-hmm. Why not? Do you have a picture? Oh, I have, Do you a, picture have a picture of, of the second coming of Christ. I have a picture of God's face. Y'all ready for this? Uh, so this is the Lundgren family. That's Alice, and that's an asshole over here. <laughs> he looks like a real fun guy. I just—they look happy, and that's what's important. <laughs> All right. Um. So. The Lundgren family and their four children and around eight of their followers all move into a house together. What a bummer. <laughs> 15 acre rental property in Kirtland. It's uh, got a century old house that they all live in and also a barn. And, they, and the followers all call Jeffrey and Alice mom and dad. Ew, Ooh, no, no, the no. red flag. No, no, no. Yeah. Unless, Every- unless you're on mama's family. Don't. <laughs> Every night they have intense scripture classes taught by Jeffrey, of course. He can do it for hours and hours on end and they just fucking sit there and listen and preach his craziness. His negative bullshit. Mm -hmm. He tells his followers that everything they knew was wrong. They had to erase their memories and start over with what he told them. And they weren't allowed to pray without him. And (laughs) Dude. um, (laughs) Yeah. You can't tell. I'm praying right now. (laughs) You don't know. You can't tell me. Stop it. No, oh, sorry. <laughs> Not allowed to do that. With me. Amen. They turn over their paychecks. <laughs> <laughs> Click. <laughs> they turn over their paychecks to him and all their possessions to him. Fucking classic cult shit, right here. <laughs> um, he would eavesdrop on the cult members, and that made them believe that he could read their minds. Oh no! You know what I mean? He's like got the glass up to mm-hmm. the wall. <laughs> Cult members were forbidden to talk amongst themselves. They couldn't talk to each other. (laughs) What's the upside of this cult? (laughs) Just not having to think that much? They get a high five. God. (laughs) One day. Um, If they talked around, if they talked amongst each other, it was was a sin, and he called it murmuring. (laughs) Just like, oh my God. And uh, he made them all fast, and he would like fucking eat all this food around them and shit. 
and like threatened them. Uh, it was he was a psychotic person, and he was really charismatic and I think really good at speaking. I think he was definitely a I hope so psychopath. So one of the families that had become devoted followers of Jeffrey Lundgren was the Averys. In 1987, Dennis Avery, who was an assistant at a bank in Missouri, moved to Kirtland with his wife, Cheryl, and their three daughters, Trina, who was 15, Rebecca was 13, and Karen was seven. They were a family of bookworms. They were really passive people, and Jeffrey would complain about the Averys because uh, Dennis let Cheryl, quote, wear the pants in the family, which he thought was fucking sacrilegious. <laughs> like, it's a sin that you're letting your wife tell you to pick up your fucking socks off the floor. Yeah, you know? because she's talking, and that's not yeah, allowed. No, she's not being subservient, and so <laughs> wow. it's a sin. Dennis gave uh, him $10,000 from the sale of their Missouri home, but he kept some of the money for himself and his family, and he also wouldn't live in the house with them, and so Jeffrey was pissed off about that, too. Here's a picture of the, the Averys. Oh, oh, they're nice. We can, oh, okay. Okay. Whoa. So, <laughs> so. So Lundgren began preaching about the end of days and planned a raid on the temple that fucking fired his ass. <laughs> you mean the main Mormon temple? Uh-huh. Okay. He was like, we're going to raid it. And at this time, they had started practicing military maneuvers and stockpiling weapons and dressing in military garb. A bad sign at church. Yeah. <laughs> Not what it's about. No. And all the neighbors were like, uh, this isn't good. Yeah. And like told on him. Sure. And uh, also uh, one of the cult members at this point, Kevin Curry, who in 1988 was like, I'm out of here. This is not what I fucking signed up for. Uh, he goes to the FBI and tells them about his plan to use lethal force to seize the Kirtland Temple. It was planned for May 3rd, 1988, which was Lundgren's 38th birthday, which is like happy fucking birthday to me. Yeah. He's one of those like, it's my birthday all month. Yeah. And at the end... <laughs> We're going to go out for margaritas, and then we're going to raid the temple. Right. So the FBI passes the info along to Kirtland Police Chief Dennis Yarbrough, and the day before the attack, uh, they're like, Jeffrey, can you come talk to us for a minute at the police station? And he's like, no, 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 I'm not going to do that, I swear. But the, um, <laughs> he, when he gets back home to his cult, he doesn't tell them about that. He was like, I had a conversation with God who told me we're not going to raid the church. Okay. You know, in there, because then he was, but then he was like nervous that they weren't going to believe in him anymore because he didn't follow through with it. But he's like, but don't worry, we're still going to fucking do something violent. <laughs> and they're like, great, that's all we want <laughs> as followers of this religion. Yeah. So, ba -ba -ba. instead of focusing on the church, he turns his attention to his own flock, which he says has evil in it and they need to, quote, cleanse sin from the group. He says that that sin is the Avery's. It gets worse. Yeah. Always. Uh, you know, every time I look over here to tell you guys something and then look back, I can't see the words because my retinas are burned. <laughs> so it takes a minute. He tells his followers that the end of days are approaching, something that I love to fucking say all the time, <laughs> but I don't kill people. Um, and he promised other followers would get salvation if they sacrificed the Avery family. That's insanity. Yes. So they had been, at this point, his, his whole flock, which are all normal people. They're like husbands and wives and people who have normal jobs and were just really into their faith, uh, had been so whipped up into a religious frenzy that they were ready to do whatever he told them to do because of the return of Jesus Christ. So on April 17th, 1989, the Averys are called to the Lundgren residence. And when they get there in the evening, one of the members of the cult, Debbie Alaveras, she said she thought it must be God's will that this was going to happen. She uh, walked the, the... So, basically, they go... What? I know this one. You do? <laughs> now that we're almost done with it. <laughs> yes, I just, I just remember. How did you... I never heard of it before. The, are they going to walk them to the barn? Mm-hmm. Oh, fuck. Okay. Did you see an episode of something yep. about... Yep. There's an American Justice about it. Yeah. Listen, you guys hear... Uh, what's his name? Bill Curtis. Bill Curtis's voice in your head? That's right. But they were not going to go to the... <laughs> leather jacket. Da -da -da. Leather jacket for no reason. 
Okay, yeah. so they bring the family to the house, and Dennis Avery is asked to go, in, go into the barn for whatever reason. He's walked there. He's rendered unconscious with a stun gun. He's gagged, and this is the father, and dragged to a pre-dug pit where he's shot. Uh, Jeffrey shoots him in the back of the head twice, and he dies. Next, Cheryl, the wife, is lured when she told that uh, was that her husband needed help. She's bound and lowered in the pit, and she's shot three times and dies. And after that, the three daughters, Trina, 15, Becky, 13, and Karen, 7, are also shot and killed and placed next to their parents in the pit. Ugh. It's f- And all these fucking members are there, and they knew it was going to happen, and they all go along with it. In fact... Some of one of the members stood outside the barn while this happened and ran a chainsaw so the neighbors wouldn't hear oh, the gun man. go off. Well, they, they they're in deep like yeah. they're, all of their humanity was stripped away. That's the whole thing of of cults where you lose yourself entirely and it all becomes about this person you're following and you just yeah. don't. You're just doing what they say. I mean, that's the craziest. That's why they're so fascinating. Is how does that happen to a person that's manages a bank or do, does anything yeah. you, that you think oh you would know not to do this but it's that it's it's how cult well work. there was one woman who was jeffrey's cousin who like joined the cult she was like a single mom and it, it, later in interviews she's just like i wanted someone to make all the decisions for me i was scared and didn't you know didn't want to live my own life and so I, it was nice to have someone make decisions for me so at what point are you then you like no I mean, you'd hope it would be this point, but they yeah. don't. But, but also, it is that thing, too. The idea of the promise of, say, like, it, whatever the promise ends up being, with like, Jesus is returning, that becomes so real. Yeah. And that idea is, is your salvation. So you're going to do anything it takes right. to make sure that that happens. Right. It's, ugh. So sad. <laughs> I was going to say something real sacrilegious, but I'm not. <laughs> say it. I mean, what if, what if, uh, what if it's not that great? <laughs> when you go to heaven and you did all of that for just being like I guess it's cool mm. yeah what if it's just like a shitty diner and you're like oh I was really uh, looking forward to this for this for this <laughs> sorry Jesus I'm sorry I'm Jewish I don't have to apologize <laughs> Uh, <laughs> boop. I just have to call my aunt, who's a nun, and tell her everything <laughs> that we did tonight, and then I'll be fine. Cool. Da, da, da. During the flood, okay. Then the neighbors did say they had only heard chainsaws running that night. God, which is a horrible, yeah. horrible thing to Enough. hear at night. Yeah. You are not cutting wood at no. night. Not safe. Mm. The bodies of the Avery family are covered in lime and buried in the pit, then covered with. They just like scatter trash all over it. And then um, they go back to the farmhouse and hold a prayer meeting. The very fucking next morning, the FBI and cops show up to the house to kind of do a welfare check. And because of the complaints from the neighbors who were sick of nighttime chainsaws. Yeah. So imagine this fucking flock is like, oh shit, like the next morning. Yeah. But they're just, they're, they don't even know what's going on yet. So the, the FBI interviews everyone, make sure they all want to be there uh, you know, by choice. And one of the police members was like, well, what about, there's a family called the Avery's. Do we need to interview them? And they said no, because they weren't deemed important because they weren't as active in the cult. So they never sought to find them. Sought to find them? Maybe. Sought them out? <laughs> sought them out's good. Sought them out. Okay. Steven. Okay. <laughs> so later that day, they're like, that was a close call. Let's get the fuck out of here. So they, uh, they get the fuck out of there. <laughs> oh, and they go to a remote campsite in West Virginia where they lived in the... F- <laughs> <laughs> Guys. <laughs> where they live in the fucking wilderness. Wilderness. <laughs> For boo, exactly. <laughs> there is a strong booing section that I'm into right here. <laughs> They go and live in the wilderness for seven months. What a what? fucking bummer, man. What did they... And the whole time they were like, dude, you told us that, that he was going to come to Kirtland. And right. so why are we here? Quick change of plans. Yeah. It is still my birthday. <laughs> <laughs> I want to camp. And after all these months, the fucking Lundgren family are, are like, just kidding. It's going it's gonna to happen in Southern California. And they fucking take off and leave everyone behind, the family. Really? Yeah. So everyone is suddenly like, oh, shit. Fuck. We might have made a huge mistake. 
Um, so by December 31st, in 1989, this cult member, Larry Johnson, whose wife had left him to take up with the Lundgrens too, in southern, sunny Southern California, was like, oh shit, this was a bad idea. And he contacts ATF agents in Kansas City. He spills the beans, tells them fucking everything, including details of his own involvement in the murders, and gives the agents a hand-drawn map of the bar- of the barn where the pit is, where they can find the bodies. Wow. Um, so on January 3rd, I guess they wait till after New Year's. Uh, <laughs> they were just trying to arrange schedules and stuff. It's tough. Like, you know they couldn't get a hold of the judge for him to sign a, sur- a yeah. fucking search warrant? Yeah. Because the judge is just plastered out of his... No, <laughs> I, this is not... I mean, you never know. I'm making shit up. That could be true. <laughs> so they searched the burial pit uh, based on the drawings, and after clearing away large amounts of garbage and debris, they, get, they begin digging, and with... By the time it's dark out, they find the first set of human remains. They find Dennis. Then they find the rest of the bodies. And they're all horrified. This is like a nice, you know, suburban town with a lot of religious people in it. Um, and so arrest warrants are issued for Lundgren and 12 of his followers, including Alice, his wife, and their 19-year-old son, Damon. You named your kid Damon? <laughs> it's close to Damien, which is satanic. Or demon. Richard Brand is one of the cult members. Richard Branson at Virgin mm-hmm. Airlines? Sharon Blanchilli, C- Catherine Johnson, Daniel Kraft, Ronald Sh- Sharon Luff. Von Chilly? Bon- Sharon Von Chilly? Sharon Bluntsley. Ronald Luff, Susan Luff, Deborah Oliveras, Dennis Patrick, Tanya Patrick, and Gregory Winship. Uh, so here's, a, I think I have a photo of all of them. <laughs> I mean, at once, don't worry. <laughs> Here we go. So these are the people that fled to L.A. No, these are all of them. Oh, it's everybody? Fucking cult members. Jesus. Check it and see. Look at their uh, dead eyes. This was, was this a lens crafter's cult? <laughs> mm, mm. Rough stuff. Yeah. Um, but, 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 so... The charges against the 12 accomplices ranged from conspiracy to commit aggravated murder, complicity to aggravated murder and kidnapping. Um, and by inside of one week, all the suspects are in police custody. Uh, some of the members had charges dropped, not many, due to non-involvement or only given obstruction of justice charges. But the rest of them get some fucking hard ass time. Uh, Richard Brand is one of them, Richard Brand is 26 years old when he was arrested in connection with the, the murders of the Averys. He's a, co- let's just like explain it. He's a fucking college graduate with a degree in civil engineering and he participated. To avoid a life sentence, he agrees to plead guilty to five counts of complicity to aggravated murder in exchange for testimony against Jeffrey Lundgren and other cult members. Uh, he was in the barn on the, in the night when the Averys were murdered and he... Uh, so Jeffrey Lundgren is the triggerman, but but um, but 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 he says they were all willing accomplices, though. His job was to help bind and gag the victims before they were shot. It's insane. So Ronald Luff, he's a key in planning and facilitating the murders with Jeffrey. Is sentenced to 170 years in life to life. Um, Alice Lundgren, who was trying to say that you know she wasn't really part of it, she was just a subservient wife. Uh, and that he was abusive. Ever, the jury was like, hell fucking no. She's sentenced to 150 years to life in prison. Two months later, their son Damon is sentenced to four consecutive life terms without parole for 120 years. Shit. And then, so Jeffrey Lundgren's trial starts in 1990, and it only takes two hours for the jury to find him guilty of five counts each of aggravated murder and kidnapping. But then on his, at his sentencing, he's allowed to uh, give like a talk, whatever. What? Five fucking hours he preaches his no. insane fucking shit. For five hours, he like stands at this pulpit like he's giving a fucking sermon and goes on and on. And everyone like, in the courtroom is like, we could see how fucking insane he was by yeah, that. Yeah, exactly. He just seems so crazy. Just gonna tack one more life sentence on right. there. Right. <laughs> Here's a photo of him after when he was arrested. Oh, he's like a low rent Fabio. Oh, ouch! Youch! Yeah. I don't know if he wore that jacket. I'd listen to what he had to say. <laughs> Shit! I know. White tracksuit? Who are you? So, 
da 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 blah 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 hold on two hours then he he gets sentenced to die in the electric chair oh shit plea deals are reached with <laughs> because of that sermon <laughs> sorry 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 cancel that <laughs> Cancel that order. <laughs> Plea deals are reached with six defendants who agreed to provide testimony in exchange for reduced sentences. All those defendants have been paroled, uh, six of them. Five of those people spent about 20 years behind bars before going free. Five are now in prison after having served their... T- wait, five are now out of prison. Four are still serving time, including Alice Lundgren, and she's not el- eligible for parole until... And then there's a period at the end of that sentence. <laughs> Like, what, Georgia? (laughs) I think it was like 2098. Okay. Okay. That's a great number. Okay. All right. So then on October 24th, 2006, with this, uh, he had, uh, last of the appeals are exhausted. Jeffrey Lundgren is executed by lethal injection at the Southern Ohio Correctional Facility 16 years after he murdered the Avery family. Shit. Yeah. (laughs) A smattering of polite applause (laughs) for lethal injection. He died with no family or friends among the witnesses, and no one claimed his body, and he was buried in a prison grave. Shit. (laughs) Shit. However, a Missouri church community raised thousands of dollars. No, 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 no. Come on. Nope. To pay for the burial of the Avery family in Missouri. See? Of course they did. Yeah. That's, what, that's what real church does. That's yeah. what real church does. And they launched a children's charity in memory of Trina, Rebecca, and Karen Avery. Yay. And that is the fucking Kirtland cult Fuck killings. Fuck you guys. God. This was a heavy episode. It's heavy. Uh, I would have had a breakdown if Steven's beautiful face wasn't here this time. <laughs> Thank just, you, Steven's cookie face, for yeah. getting us through that. Oh. It's just like having him in the loft. It's just like brushing your hair with his mustache. Mm. Stuff that gets you through the hard times. Yeah. Um, do we have... We always listen. have time for a hometown. Okay. Rules. You have we to. shouldn't even. If your hand is up right now, you're Look not getting Look at these gorgeous picked. lights. Look Sit at down. this. Oh, beautiful. Hi. You have to listen to rules. Because they're crucial. Crucial rules. Crucial rules. Here we go. Balcony, it's not happening. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. This is a union theater. We have to leave at a certain time. We can't wait for you to haul your ass down here. Um, okay. okay, here's the rules. We want it to be a local story. Don't come up here and tell some fucking Florida story. We don't Ohio. want to hear it. Ohio. Ohio. Cleveland. Anywhere. Nearby. Also, as you know, you can't be so drunk that you can't tell your own story. <laughs> Buzzed is fine, but you have to keep it moving. Uh, this is the crucial rule that we realized in the last couple shows. Please remember as the storyteller and as the hometown teller tonight, everyone else in the audience hates your guts. So... <laughs> I wouldn't shout out a friend when you got up here. I wouldn't be kissing fingers and pointing to people. I would tell your story quickly, factually, make sure you know the names, um, you know, make sure that you've got it in hand. Uh, not, but not, but you can't. All right, here we go. Yeah. So uh, was there any other, was what rules? Oh, obviously you can't read off a piece of paper. Yeah. People know how to do it at this point. Someone just said my name. Of oh, course they're saying your shit. name. Don't be a sap. Now she's crying. There's also the other rules. There's no crying. <laughs> or there's only crying. Look, there's oh, Vince, the everybody. <laughs> That's the man who got us here tonight. Oh. Hi. What's your name? Uh, my come name here. is Carly. You have come to come here. over here. You, you have to let him look at you. Harley? Hi. <laughs> Carly with a C? Ooh, yes, with a C. And okay. a Y. Where are you from? <laughs> no E or I. You have fuzz. Where are you from? Uh, um, I am from... Uh, thank yeah. you. Here. Thank you. Get up there. Get up on that. Um, I'm from Cleveland. Oh! Yes! That's what we're talking about. 
out. <laughs> so all your friends in the matching uh, shirts, my girls. they were pointing. We made some shirts. That's adorable. What does it say? Oh, it's really, it says SSDGM. SSDGM with some murdery scenes. Beautiful. The forest. Yeah. Um, they were pointing well at you furiously. Why were, is it because you have a great hometown? It's pretty good. It's pretty good. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I like it. Humble, I'm low key. I'm pick all of Although, you out if it's bad. <laughs> I'm very concerned about being respectful towards... The people Uh-oh. involved. We all. Are, yes. um, we all. So I'm not going to directly name names. Okay. If that's okay. 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 Um, <laughs> okay. So in about 2011, I guess I was working at um, as a substitute English teacher at my old high school, okay. <laughs> which is strange in itself. <laughs> um, <laughs> where I met some pretty awesome new English teachers, and uh, one was this young woman. Oh, sorry, can we just take a moment to clap for English teachers? Yes, please? thank you. <laughs> God bless them, they're all also Uber drivers. Okay. <laughs> That's right, I've been paying half of my sister's mortgage for years. That's how it is, teachers. All right, uh, so anyways, I met this young woman who was fresh out of college, you know, still living at home, really passionate about her job. And anyways, I met her and I'm sitting in the office and the head of the department walks in and she's like, oh, young badass teacher. I'm not naming your name. Let's call her. What are we going to call her? Let's call her Annie. Great. Okay. Okay. She's like, Annie, have you heard anything about your mom? Like, where, you know, I heard she was calm. Like, do you hear any from her? Where is, she, where is she? Do you know anything? And I was like, ooh. <laughs> um, anyways, and Annie was all like, oh, yeah. You know, she left a few weeks ago. And, you know, we're not that concerned. My dad said she just, like, you know, met up with this group. And... You know, we'll see her eventually. Uh-oh. And basically it was kind of like, oh, we're okay. Anyways, a few weeks later, I get an email from the school saying Annie's mom did not join a cult. <laughs> she was murdered <laughs> um, by her husband. Oh. Annie's dad. Ooh. Anyways, um, as the story goes... Uh, <laughs> Why are you um, laughing? <laughs> it's nervousness. <laughs> Out of nervousness. Just, just kidding. <laughs> so anyways, Annie's, uh, Annie apparently got suspicious of what was going on in our house. Apparently there was a foul stench oh, coming no. from her garage and, you know, kept asking her dad, what is that? What is that? Apparently they kept chickens in their backyard and he was claiming that one of the chickens had died and he just hadn't cleaned up the body or whatever (laughs) so clearly Annie was smarter than that and eventually was very disturbed by it and called the police (gasps) and the police showed up turns out her mom's body was in the garage Um, apparently she was had a Stuffed in a sleeping bag with a plastic bag over her head. There was like panties stuck in her mouth and a tarp over her body that was duct taped. Bag of lime, bleach, everything all right there. Apparently when the um, police showed up, the dad was trying to like block. Oh, I'm sorry. Side note. The dad was an ex-cop. Uh-oh. Here we go. Living in the town that he worked for. So when the police showed up, I'm assuming he was not happy to see his old colleagues trying to uh, break into their garage. And he had to be tased (laughs) in order to get in where they found this terrible scene. Oh, my God. God. Um, Anyways, I guess. Did you ever see Annie again? Story. Um, she did not come back to work, oh. as I know. And then, but now she is back at the school, and apparently living an awesome life. And you know, I'm not c- friends with her anymore. I was more of an acquaintance type thing, but it was one of those things that was like, oh my god, I know this person that this happened to, and so, bananas. so be it. It's bananas. insane. Oh my god, oh my Carly, god. you guys. Carly. Oh yeah. Look what she gets. <laughs> 
Yeah, yeah that's right. <laughs> Great job, honey. Thank you. Give uh, Vince the mic or Karen. Oh, you okay. can give it to him. Okay. Fun. <laughs> Fun. Now she has a job. <laughs> Great job, Carly. Great job, Carly. Oh. Awesome. Wow, that went really fast, you guys. <laughs> I'm so sweaty. <sighs> Thank you so much for everything, you guys. Yeah. We're... <laughs> it's so crazy that we say this every show, yeah. but we're so thrilled that we get to do this. We have the best fucking time. We love coming out and, and actually meeting the people that listen to our insane podcast. And the fact that you guys turn up the way you do, the way you sell out theaters this size for us. It's, so uh, thank you so much. It's thank so you. amazing. We're so thrilled and we're so happy and feel so lucky we get to be a part of this. So thank you guys for supporting us. Yeah. And we, um, we love you. We love you and stay sexy. And, and don't get Bye, Cleveland!